Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to The Well Told Tale. Every week we bring you the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. Today we have part three of The Marvelous Land of Oz by L. Frank Baum. Tip, Jack Pumpkinhead, the Wooden Sawhorse and the Scarecrow, now the ousted king of the Emerald City, have escaped the city and are trying to make their way to the Scarecrow's old friend, the Tin Woodman, who is also a king nowadays. But as we rejoin the action, our heroes have fallen into a river. It's time to pull up a chair, relax, and enjoy part three of The Marvellous Land of Oz by L. Frank Baum. The Journey to the Tin Woodman Tip was well-soaked and dripping water from every angle of his body, but he managed to lean forward and shout in the ear of the sore horse, Keep still, you fool! Keep still! The horse at once ceased struggling and floated calmly upon the surface, its wooden body being as buoyant as a raft. What does that word fool mean? inquired the horse. It's a term of reproach, answered Tip, somewhat ashamed at the expression. I only use it when I'm angry. Then it pleases me to be able to call you a fool in return, said the horse, for I did not make the river, nor put it in our way, so only a term of reproach is fit for one who becomes angry with me for falling into the water. That is quite evident, replied Tip, so I will acknowledge myself in the wrong. Then he called out to the pumpkin head, "'Are you all right, Jack?' There was no reply, so the boy called to the king, "'Are you all right, Your Majesty?' The scarecrow groaned. "'I'm all wrong, somehow,' he said in a weak voice. "'How very wet this water is!' Tip was bound so tightly by the cord that he could not turn his head to look at his companions, so he said to the sawhorse, Paddle with your legs towards the shore. The horse obeyed, and although their progress was slow, they finally reached the opposite river bank, at a place where it was low enough to enable the creature to scramble upon dry land. With some difficulty, the boy managed to get his knife out of his pocket and cut the cords that bound the riders to one another and to the wooden horse. He heard the scarecrow fall to the ground with the mushy sound, and then he himself quickly dismounted and looked at his friend Jack. The wooden body, with its gorgeous clothing, still sat upright upon the horse's back, but the pumpkin head was gone, and only the sharpened stick that served for a neck was visible. As for the scarecrow, the straw in his body had shaken down with all the jolting and packed itself into his legs and the lower parts of his body, which appeared very plump and round, while his upper half seemed like an empty sack. Upon his head, the scarecrow still wore the heavy crown which had been sewed on to prevent his losing it, but the head was now so damp and limp that the weight of the gold and jewels sagged forward and crushed the painted face into a mass of wrinkles that made him look exactly like a Japanese pug dog. Tip would have laughed had he not been so anxious about his man Jack, but the scarecrow, however damaged, was all there, while the pumpkin head that was so necessary for Jack's existence was missing. So the boy seized a long pole that fortunately lay near at hand and anxiously turned again toward the river. Far out upon the waters, he sighed the golden hue of the pumpkin, which gently bobbed up and down with the motion of the waves. At that moment, it was quite out of Tip's reach, but after a time it floated nearer and still nearer, until the boy was able to reach it with his pole and draw it to the shore. Then he brought it up to the top of the bank, carefully wiped the water from its pumpkin face with his handkerchief, and ran with it to Jack and replaced the head upon the man's neck. "'Dear me!' were Jack's first words. "'What a dreadful experience!' I wonder if water is liable to spoil pumpkins. Tip did not think a reply was necessary, for he knew that the scarecrow also stood in need of his help, so he carefully removed the straw from the king's body and legs and spread it out in the sun to dry. The wet clothing he hung over the body of the sore horse. If water spoils pumpkins, observed Jack with a deep sigh, then my days are numbered. 
I've never noticed that water spoils pumpkins, returned Tip, unless the water happens to be boiling. If your head isn't cracked, my friend, you must be in a fairly good condition. Oh, my head isn't cracked in the least, declared Jack more cheerfully. Then don't worry, retorted the boy. Care once killed a cat. Then, said Jack seriously, I am very glad indeed that I am not a cat. The sun was fast drying their clothing, and Tip stirred up his majesty's straw so that the warm rays might absorb the moisture and make it as crisp and dry as ever. When this had been accomplished, he stuffed the scarecrow into symmetrical shape and smoothed out his face so that he wore his usual gay and charming expression. "'Thank you very much,' said the monarch brightly, as he walked about and found himself to be well-balanced. "'There are several distinct advantages in being a scarecrow, for if one has friends near at hand to repair damages, nothing very serious can happen to you.' "'I wonder if hot sunshine is liable to crack pumpkins,' said Jack, with an anxious ring in his voice. "'Not at all, not at all,' replied the Scarecrow gaily. "'All you need fear, my boy, is old age. "'When your golden youth has decayed, we shall quickly part company. "'But you needn't look forward to it. "'We'll discover the fact ourselves and notify you. "'But come, let us resume our journey. "'I am anxious to greet my friend the Tin Woodman.' So they remounted the saw horse, Tip holding on to the post, the pumpkin head clinging to Tip, and the scarecrow with both arms around the wooden form of Jack. "'Go slowly, for now there is no danger of pursuit,' said Tip to his steed. "'All right,' responded the creature, in a voice rather gruff. "'Aren't you a little horse?' asked the pumpkin head politely. The saw horse gave an angry prance and rolled one knotty eye backward towards Tip, "'See here,' he growled. "'Can't you protect me from insult?' "'To be sure,' answered Tip soothingly. "'I am sure Jack meant no harm, "'and it will not do for us to quarrel, you know. "'We must all remain good friends.' "'I'll have nothing more to do with that pumpkin head,' "'declared the sawhorse. "'He loses his head too easily to suit me.' There seemed no fitting reply to this speech, so for a time they rode along in silence. After a while, the scarecrow remarked, "'This reminds me of old times. It was upon this grassy knoll that I once saved Dorothy from the stinging bees of the Wicked Witch of the West.' "'Do stinging bees injure pumpkins?' asked Jack, glancing around fearfully. Oh, they're all dead, so it doesn't matter, replied the scarecrow. And here is where Nick Chopper destroyed the Wicked Witch's grey wolves. Who was Nick Chopper? asked Tip. That is the name of my friend, the Tin Woodman, answered His Majesty. And here is where the winged monkeys captured and bound us and flew away with little Dorothy, he continued after they had travelled a little way further. "'Do winged monkeys ever eat pumpkins?' asked Jack, with a shiver of fear. "'I do not know, but you have little cause to worry, "'for the winged monkeys are now the slaves of Glinda the Good, "'who owns the golden cap that commands their services,' said the scarecrow reflectively. "'Then the stuffed monarch became lost in thought, "'recalling the days of past adventures, "'and the sawhorse rocked and rolled over the flower-strewn fields "'and carried its riders swiftly upon their way. "'Twilight fell by and by, and then the dark shadows of night, "'so Tip stopped the horse and they all proceeded to dismount. "'I'm tired out,' said the boy, yawning wearily, "'and the grass is soft and cool. "'Let us lie down here and sleep till morning.' "'I can't sleep,' said Jack. "'I never do,' said the Scarecrow. "'I do not even know what sleep is,' said the Sawhorse. "'Still, we must have consideration for this poor boy "'who is made of flesh and blood and bone and gets tired,' "'suggested the Scarecrow in his usual thoughtful manner. "'I remember it was the same way with little Dorothy. "'We always had to sit through the night while she slept.' "'I'm sorry,' said Tip meekly, "'but I can't help it, and I'm dreadfully hungry, too.' "'Here is a new danger,' remarked Jack gloomily. "'I hope you are not fond of eating pumpkins.' 
Not unless they're stewed and made into pies, answered the boy, laughing. So have no fears of me, friend Jack. What a coward that pumpkin head is, said the sawhorse scornfully. You might be a coward yourself if you knew you were liable to spoil, retorted Jack angrily. There, there, interrupted the scarecrow. Don't let us quarrel. We all have our weaknesses, dear friends, so we must strive to be considerate of one another. Since this poor boy is hungry and has nothing whatever to eat, let us all remain quiet and allow him to sleep, for it is said that in sleep a mortal may forget even hunger. Thank you exclaimed Tip gratefully. Your Majesty is fully as good as you are wise, and that is saying a good deal. He then stretched himself upon the grass, and using the stuffed form of the scarecrow for a pillow, was presently fast asleep. A Nickel-Plated Emperor Tip awoke soon after dawn, but the scarecrow had already risen and plucked with his clumsy fingers a double handful of ripe berries from some bushes nearby. These the boy ate greedily, finding them an ample breakfast, and afterward the little party resumed its journey. After an hour's ride they reached the summit of a hill from whence they espied the city of the Winkies, and noted the tall domes of the Emperor's Palace, rising from the clusters of more modest buildings. The scarecrow became greatly animated at this sight, and exclaimed, "'How delighted I shall be to see my old friend the Tin Woodman again! I hope that he rules his people more successfully than I have ruled mine!' "'Is the Tin Woodman the Emperor of the Winkies?' asked the horse. "'Yes, indeed! They invited him to rule over them soon after the Wicked Witch was destroyed, and as Nick Chopper has the best heart in all the world—' I am sure he has proved an excellent and able emperor. I thought that emperor was the title of a person who rules an empire, said Tip, and the country of the Winkies is only a kingdom. Don't mention that to the Tin Woodman, exclaimed the Scarecrow earnestly. You would hurt his feelings terribly. He is a proud man, as he has every reason to be, and it pleases him to be termed emperor rather than king. I'm sure it makes no difference to me, replied the boy. The sawhorse now ambled forward at a pace so fast that its riders had hard work to stick upon its back, so there was little further conversation until they drew up beside the palace steps. An aged winky, dressed in a uniform of silver cloth, came forward to assist them to alight. Said the scarecrow to his personage, Show us at once to meet your master, the emperor. The man looked from one to another of the party in an embarrassed way, and finally answered, "'I fear I must ask you to wait for a time. The Emperor is not receiving this morning.' "'How is that?' inquired the Scarecrow anxiously. "'I hope nothing has happened to him.' "'Oh, nothing serious,' returned the man. "'But this is His Majesty's day for being polished, and just now his august presence is thickly smeared with Putts pomade. Oh, I see, cried the scarecrow, greatly reassured. My friend was ever inclined to be a dandy, and I suppose he is now more proud than ever of his personal appearance. He is indeed, said the man, with a polite bow. Our mighty emperor has lately caused himself to be nickel plated. "'Good gracious!' the Scarecrow exclaimed at hearing this. "'If his wit bears the same polish, how sparkling it must be! "'But show us in. I'm sure the Emperor will receive us, even in his present state.' "'The Emperor's state is always magnificent,' said the man. "'But I will venture to tell him of your arrival, and will receive his commands concerning you.' So the party followed the servant into a splendid anteroom, and the sawhorse ambled awkwardly after them, having no knowledge that a horse might be expected to remain outside. The travellers were at first somewhat awed by their surroundings, and even the scarecrow seemed impressed as he examined the rich hangings of silver cloth caught up into knots and fastened with tiny silver axes. Upon a handsome centre table stood a large silver oil can, richly engraved with scenes from the past adventures of the Tin Woodman. Dorothy, the Cowardly Lion, and the Scarecrow, the lines of the engraving being traced upon the silver in yellow gold. On the walls hung several portraits, that of the Scarecrow seeming to be the most prominent and carefully executed, while a large painting of the famous Wizard of Oz, 
in act of presenting the tin woodman with a heart, covered almost one entire end of the room. When the visitors gazed at these things in silent admiration, they suddenly heard a loud voice in the next room exclaim, "'Well, well, well, what a great surprise!' And then the door burst open and Nick Chopper rushed into their midst and caught the scarecrow in a close and loving embrace that creased him into many folds and wrinkles. "'My dear old friend, my noble comrade!' cried the Tin Woodman joyfully. "'How delighted I am to meet you once again!' And then he released the scarecrow and held him at arm's length while he surveyed the beloved painted features. But, alas, the face of the scarecrow and many portions of his body bore great blotches of putts pomade, for the Tin Woodman, in his eagerness to welcome his friend, had quite forgotten the condition of his toilet and had rubbed the thick coating of paste from his own body to that of his comrade. "'Dear me,' said the Scarecrow dolefully, "'what a mess I'm in!' "'Oh, never mind, old friend,' returned the Tin Woodman. "'I'll send you to my Imperial Laundry, and you'll come out as good as new.' "'Won't I be mangled?' asked the Scarecrow. "'No, indeed,' was the reply. "'But tell me, how came your Majesty here, and who are your companions?' The Scarecrow, with great politeness, introduced Tip and Jack Pumpkinhead, and the latter personage seemed to interest the Tin Woodman greatly. "'You are not very substantial, I must admit,' said the Emperor, "'but you are certainly unusual, and therefore worthy to become member of our select society.' "'I thank your Majesty,' said Jack humbly. "'I hope you are enjoying good health,' continued the Woodman, "'At present, yes,' replied the pumpkin head with a sigh. "'But I am in constant terror of the day when I shall spoil.' "'Nonsense,' said the Emperor, but in a kindly, sympathetic tone. "'Do not, and I beg of you, dampen today's sun with the showers of tomorrow. "'For before your head has time to spoil, you can have it canned, "'and in that way it may be preserved indefinitely.' Tip, during this conversation, was looking at the woodman with undisguised amazement, and noticed that the celebrated Emperor of the Winkies was composed entirely of pieces of tin, neatly soldered and riveted together into the form of a man. He rattled and clanked a little as he moved, but in the main he seemed to be most cleverly constructed, and his appearance was only marred by the thick coating of polishing paste that covered him from head to foot. The boy's intent gaze caused the tin woodman to remember that he was not in the most presentable condition, so he begged his friends to excuse him while he retired to his private apartment and allowed his servants to polish him. This was accomplished in a short time, and when the emperor returned, his nickel-plated body shone so magnificently that the scarecrow heartily congratulated him on his improved appearance. "'That nickel plate was, I confess, a happy thought,' said Nick." and it was the more necessary, because I had become somewhat scratched during my adventurous experiences. You will observe this engraved star upon my left breast. It not only indicates where my excellent heart lies, but covers very neatly the patch made by the wonderful wizard when he placed that valued organ in my breast with his own skilful hands. "'Is your heart, then, a hand organ?' asked the pumpkin head curiously. "'By no means,' responded the Emperor with dignity. "'It is, I am convinced, a strictly orthodox heart, "'although somewhat larger and warmer than most people possess.' "'Then he turned to the Scarecrow and asked, "'Are your subjects happy and contented, my dear friend?' "'I cannot say,' was the reply, "'for the girls of Oz have risen in revolt "'and driven me out of the Emerald City.' "'Great goodness!' cried the Tin Woodman. "'What a calamity!' They surely do not complain of your wise and gracious rule. No, but they say it is a poor rule that don't work both ways, answered the Scarecrow, and these females are also of the opinion that men have ruled the land long enough, so they have captured my city, robbed the treasury of all its jewels, and are running things to suit themselves. Dear me, what an extraordinary idea, cried the Emperor, who was both shocked and surprised. "'And I heard some of them say,' said Tip, "'that they intend to march here "'and capture the castle and city of the Tin Woodman.' "'Ah, we must not give them time to do that,' "'said the Emperor quickly. "'We will go at once and recapture the Emerald City "'and place the Scarecrow again upon his throne.' 
I was sure you would help me, remarked the Scarecrow in a pleased voice. How large an army can you assemble? We do not need an army, replied the woodman. We four, with the aid of my gleaming axe, are enough to strike terror into the hearts of the rebels. We five, corrected the pumpkin head. Five, repeated the tin woodman. The tin woodman looked around him in a puzzled way, for the sawhorse had until now remained quietly standing in a corner where the emperor had not noticed him. Tip immediately called the odd-looking creature to him, and it approached so awkwardly that it nearly upset the beautiful centre-table in the engraved oil-can. "'I begin to think,' remarked the tin woodman as he looked earnestly at the sawhorse, "'that wonders will never cease. How came this creature alive?' "'I did it with a magic powder.' modestly asserted the boy, and the sawhorse has been very useful to us. "'He enabled us to escape the rebels,' added the scarecrow. "'Then we must surely accept him as a comrade,' declared the emperor. "'A live sawhorse is a distinct novelty, and should prove an interesting study. Does he know anything?' "'Well, I cannot claim any great experience in life,' the sawhorse answered for himself. But I seem to learn very quickly, and often it occurs to me that I know more than any of those around me. Perhaps you do, said the Emperor, for experience does not always mean wisdom, but time is precious just now, so let us quickly make preparations to start upon our journey. The Emperor called his Lord High Chancellor and instructed him how to run the kingdom during his absence. Meanwhile, the scarecrow was taken apart, and the painted sack that served him for a head was carefully laundered and restuffed with the brains originally given him by the great wizard. His clothes were also cleaned and pressed by the imperial tailors, and his crown polished and again sewed upon his head, for the tin woodman insisted he should not renounce this badge of royalty. The scarecrow now presented a very respectable appearance, and although in no way addicted to vanity, he was quite pleased with himself and strutted a trifle as he walked. While this was being done, Tip mended the wooden limbs of Jack Pumpkinhead and made them stronger than before, and the sawhorse was also inspected to see if he was in good working order. Then, bright and early the next morning, they set out upon the return journey to the Emerald City, the tin woodman bearing upon his shoulder a gleaming axe and leading the way, while the Pumpkinhead rode upon the sawhorse, and Tip and the Scarecrow walked upon either side to make sure that he didn't fall off or become damaged. Mr. H. M. Wogglebug, T.E. Now, General Ginger, who you will remember commanded the Army of Revolt, was rendered very uneasy by the escape of the Scarecrow from the Emerald City. She feared, and with good reason, that if His Majesty and the Tin Woodman joined forces, it would mean danger to her and her entire army, for the people of Oz had not yet forgotten the deeds of these famous heroes who had passed successfully through so many startling adventures. So Ginger sent post-haste for old Momby, the witch, and promised her large rewards if she would come to the assistance of the rebel army. Momby was furious at the trick Tip had played upon her, as well as at his escape and the theft of the precious powder of life, so she needed no urging to induce her to travel to the Emerald City to assist Ginger in defeating the Scarecrow and the Tin Woodman, who had made Tip one of their friends. Momby had no sooner arrived at the royal palace than she discovered, by means of her secret magic, that the adventurers were starting upon their journey to the Emerald City, so she retired to a small room high up in a tower and locked herself in while she practised such arts as she could command to prevent the return of the Scarecrow and his companions. That was why the Tin Woodman presently stopped and said, "'Something very curious has happened. I ought to know by heart and every step of this journey, yet I fear we have already lost our way.' "'That is quite impossible,' protested the Scarecrow. "'Why do you think, my dear friend, that we have gone astray? "'Why, here before us is a great field of sunflowers, "'and I never saw this field before in all my life.' At these words they all looked around, only to find that they were indeed surrounded by a field of tall stalks, every stalk bearing at its top a gigantic sunflower.' And not only were these flowers almost blinding in their vivid hues of red and gold, 
but each one whirled around upon its stalk like a miniature windmill, completely dazzling the vision of the beholders, and so mystifying them that they knew not which way to turn. "'It's witchcraft!' exclaimed Tip. While they paused, hesitating and wondering, the tin woodman uttered a cry of impatience and advanced with swinging axe to cut down the stalks before him. But now the sunflowers suddenly stopped their rapid whirling, and the travellers plainly saw a girl's face appear in the centre of each flower. These lovely faces looked upon the astonished band with mocking smiles, and then burst into a chorus of merry laughter at the dismay their appearance caused. "'Stop! Stop!' cried Tip, seizing the woodman's arm. "'They're alive! They're girls!' At that moment the flowers began whirling again, and the faces faded away and were lost in the rapid revolutions. The tin woodman dropped his axe and sat down upon the ground. "'It would be heartless to chop down those pretty creatures,' said he despondently, "'and yet I do not know how else we can proceed upon our way. "'They looked to me strangely like the faces of the army of revolt,' mused the scarecrow, but I cannot conceive how the girls could have followed us here so quickly. I believe it's magic, said Tip positively, and that someone is playing a trick upon us. I've known old Momby do things like that before. Probably it's nothing more than an illusion, and there are no sunflowers here at all. Then let us shut our eyes and walk forward, suggested the woodman. Excuse me, replied the scarecrow, my eyes are not painted to shut. "'Because you happen to have tin eyelids, you must not imagine we are all built in the same way.' "'And the eyes of the saw horse are not eyes,' said Jack, leaning forward to examine them. "'Nevertheless, you must ride quickly forward,' commanded Tip, "'and we will follow after you and so try to escape. "'My eyes are already so dazzled that I can scarcely see.' So the pumpkin head rode boldly forward, and Tip grasped the stub tail of the sawhorse and followed with closed eyes. The scarecrow and the tin woodman brought up the rear, and before they had gone many yards, a joyful shout from Jack announced that the way was clear before them. Then all paused to look backwards, but not a trace of the field of sunflowers remained. More cheerfully now they proceeded upon their journey, but old Momby had so changed the appearance of the landscape that they would surely have been lost had not the scarecrow wisely concluded to take their direction from the sun, for no witchcraft could change the course of the sun, and it was therefore a safe guide. However, other difficulties lay before them. The sawhorse stepped into a rabbit hole and fell to the ground, the pumpkin head was pitched high into the air, and his history would probably have ended at that exact moment had not the tin woodman skilfully caught the pumpkin as it descended and saved it from injury. Tip soon had it fitted to the neck again and replaced Jack upon his feet, but the sawhorse did not escape so easily, for when his leg was pulled from the rabbit hole, it was found to have been broken short off and must be replaced or repaired before he could go a step further. "'This is quite serious,' said the tin woodman. "'If there were trees nearby, I might soon manufacture another leg for this animal, but I cannot see even a shrub for miles around.' "'And there are neither fences nor houses in this part of the land of Oz,' added the Scarecrow disconsolately. "'Then what should we do?' inquired the boy. "'I suppose I must start my brain working,' replied His Majesty the Scarecrow, "'for experience has taught me that I can do anything if I but take time to think it out.' "'Let us all think,' said Tip, "'and perhaps we shall find a way to repair the sore horse.' So they sat in a row upon the grass and began to think, while the sawhorse occupied itself by gazing curiously upon its broken limb. "'Does it hurt?' asked the tin woodman in a soft, sympathetic voice. "'Not in the least,' returned the sawhorse. "'But my pride is injured to find that my anatomy is so brittle.' For a time the little group remained in silent thought. Presently the tin woodman raised his head and looked over the fields. "'What sort of creature is that which approaches us?' he asked wonderingly. The others followed his gaze and discovered coming towards them the most extraordinary object they had ever beheld. It advanced quickly and noiselessly over the soft grass, and in a few minutes stood before the adventurers and regarded them with an astonishment equal to their own. The scarecrow was calm under all circumstances. 
"'Good morning,' he said politely. The stranger removed his hat with a flourish, bowed very low, and then responded, "'Good morning, one and all. I hope you are, as an aggregation, enjoying excellent health. Permit me to present my card.' With this courteous speech, it extended a card towards the scarecrow, who accepted it, turned it over and over, and handed it with a shake of his head to Tip. The boy read aloud, Mr. H. M. Wogglebug, T.E. Dear me, ejaculated the pumpkin head, staring somewhat intently. How very peculiar, said the tin woodman. Tip's eyes were round and wondering, and the sawhorse uttered a sigh and turned away its head. "'Are you really a Wogglebug?' inquired the Scarecrow. "'Most certainly, my dear sir,' answered the stranger briskly. "'Is not my name upon the card?' "'It is,' said the Scarecrow. "'But may I ask what H.M. stands for?' "'H.M. means highly magnified,' returned the Wogglebug proudly. "'Oh, I see,' the Scarecrow viewed the stranger critically. "'And are you, in truth, highly magnified?' "'Sir,' said the Wogglebug, I take you for a gentleman of judgment and discernment. Does it not occur to you that I am several thousand times greater than any Wogglebug you ever saw before? Therefore, it is plainly evident that I am highly magnified, and there is no good reason why you should doubt the fact. Pardon me, returned the Scarecrow. My brains are slightly mixed since I was last laundered. Would it be improper for me to ask also what the T.E. at the end of your name stands for? Those letters express my degree answered the Wogglebug with a condescending smile. To be more explicit, the initials mean that I am thoroughly educated. Oh, said the Scarecrow, much relieved. Tip had not yet taken his eyes off this wonderful personage. What he saw was a great round bug-like body supported upon two slender legs which ended in delicate feet, the toes curling upward. The body of the Wogglebug was rather flat, and judging from what could be seen of it was of a glistening dark brown colour upon the back, while the front was striped with alternate bands of light brown and white, blending together at the edges. Its arms were fully as slender as its legs, and upon a rather long neck was perched its head, not unlike the head of a man, except that its nose ended in a curling antenna, or feeler, and its ears from the upper points bore antennae that decorated the sides of its head like two miniature curling pigtails. It must be admitted that the round black eyes were rather bulging in appearance, but the expression upon the Wogglebug's face was by no means unpleasant. For dress, the insect wore a dark blue swallowtail coat with a yellow silk lining and a flower in the buttonhole, a vest of white duck that stretched tightly across his wide body, knickerbockers of fawn-coloured plush fastened at the knees with gilt buckles, and perched upon its small head was jauntily set a tall silk hat. Standing upright before our amazed friends, the Wogglebug appeared to be fully as tall as the Tin Woodman, and surely no bug in all the land of Oz had ever before attained so enormous a size. "'I confess,' said the Scarecrow, "'that your abrupt appearance has caused me surprise, and no doubt has startled my companions. I hope, however, that this circumstance will not distress you. We shall probably get used to you in time.' "'Do not apologise, I beg of you,' returned the Wogglebug earnestly. "'It affords me great pleasure to surprise people, "'for surely I cannot be classed with ordinary insects, "'and am entitled to both curiosity and admiration from those I meet.' "'You are indeed,' agreed His Majesty. "'If you will permit me to seat myself in your august company,' "'continued the stranger, "'I will gladly relate my history, "'so that you will be able to comprehend my unusual, "'may I say, remarkable, appearance.' "'You may say what you please,' answered the Tin Woodman briefly. So the Wogglebug sat down upon the grass, facing the little group of wanderers, and told them the following story. A Highly Magnified History It is but honest that I should acknowledge at the beginning of my recital that I was born an ordinary Wogglebug, began the creature in a frank and friendly tone. Knowing no better, I used my arms as well as my legs for walking, and crawled under the edges of stones or hid among the roots of grasses with no thought beyond finding a few insects smaller than myself to feed upon. The chill nights rendered me stiff and motionless, for I wore no clothing, but each morning the warm rays of the sun gave me new life and restored me to activity. A horrible existence is this, but you must remember it is the regular ordained existence of wogglebugs, as well as of many other tiny little creatures that inhabit the earth. But destiny had singled me out, 
humble though I was for a grander fate. One day I crawled near to a country schoolhouse, and my curiosity being excited by the monotonous hum of the students within, I made bold to enter and creep along a crack between two boards until I reached the far end where, in front of a hearth of glowing embers, sat the master at his desk. No one noticed so small a creature as a wogglebug, and when I found that the hearth was even warmer and more comfortable than the sunshine, I resolved to establish my future home beside it, so I found a charming nest between two bricks and hid myself therein for many, many months. Professor Know-it-all is doubtless the most famous scholar in the land of Oz, and after a few days I began to listen to the lectures and discourses he gave his pupils. Not one of them was more attentive than the humble, unnoticed Wogglebug, and I acquired in this way a fund of knowledge that I will myself confess is simply marvellous. That is why I place T.E. thoroughly educated upon my cards, for my greatest pride lies in the fact that the world cannot produce another Wogglebug with a tenth part of my own culture and erudition. I do not blame you, said the Scarecrow. Education is a thing to be proud of. I'm educated myself. The mess of brains given me by the great wizard is considered by my friends to be unexcelled. Nevertheless, interrupted the Tin Woodman, a good heart is, I believe, much more desirable than education or brains. Me, said the Sawhorse, a good leg is more desirable than either. Could seeds be considered in the light of brains? inquired the pumpkin head abruptly. Keep quiet, commanded Tip sternly. Very well, dear father, answered the obedient Jack. The Wogglebug listened patiently, even respectfully, to these remarks, and then resumed his story. I must have lived fully three years in that secluded schoolhouse hearth, said he, drinking thirstily of the ever-flowing fount of limpid knowledge before me. Quite poetical, commented the Scarecrow, nodding his head approvingly. But one day, continued the bug, a marvellous circumstance occurred that altered my very existence and brought me to my present pinnacle of greatness. The professor discovered me in the act of crawling across the hearth, and before I could escape he had caught me between his thumb and forefinger. "'My dear children,' said he, "'I have captured a wogglebug, a very rare and interesting specimen. Do any of you know what a wogglebug is?' "'No!' yelled the scholars in chorus. Then, said the professor, I will get out my famous magnifying glass and throw the insect upon a screen in a highly magnified condition, that you may all study carefully its peculiar construction and become acquainted with its habits and its manner of life. He then brought from the cupboard a most curious instrument, and before I could realise what had happened, I found myself thrown upon a screen in a highly magnified state, even as you behold me now. The students stood up on their stools and craned their necks forward to get a better view of me, and two little girls jumped upon the sill of an open window where they could see more plainly. Behold, cried the professor in a loud voice, this highly magnified wogglebug, one of the most curious insects in existence. Being thoroughly educated and knowing what is required of a cultured gentleman, at this juncture I stood upright and, placing my hand upon my bosom, made a very polite bow. My action being unexpected must have startled them, for one of the little girls perched upon the window sill gave a scream and fell backward out of the window, drawing her companion with her as she disappeared. The professor uttered a cry of horror and rushed away through the door to see if the poor children were injured by the fall. The scholars followed after him in a wild mob, and I was left alone in the schoolroom, still in a highly magnified state, and free to do as I pleased. It immediately occurred to me that this was a good opportunity to escape. I was proud of my great size, and realised that now I could travel anywhere in the world, while my superior culture would make me a fit associate for the most learned person I might chance to meet. So while the professor picked the little girls, who were more frightened than hurt, off the ground, and the pupils clustered around him closely grouped, I calmly walked out of the schoolhouse, turned a corner, and escaped unnoticed to a grove of trees that stood near. "'Wonderful!' exclaimed the pumpkin head admiringly. It was indeed, agreed the Wogglebug. I have never ceased to congratulate myself for escaping while I was highly magnified, for even my excessive knowledge would have proved of little use to me had I remained a tiny, insignificant insect. I didn't know before, said Tip, looking at the Wogglebug with a puzzled expression, that insects wore clothes. Nor do they in their natural state, returned the stranger, but in the course of my wanderings I had the good fortune to save the ninth life of a tailor, Taylors having, like cats, nine lives, as you probably know, the fellow was exceedingly grateful, for had he lost that ninth life, it would have been the end of him, so he begged permission to furnish me with a stylish costume I now wear. It fits very nicely, does it not? And the Wogglebug stood up and turned himself around slowly that all might examine his person. 
He must have been a very good tailor, said the Scarecrow somewhat enviously. He was a good-hearted tailor at any rate, observed Nick Chopper. But where were you going when you met us? Tip asked the Wogglebug. Nowhere in particular, was the reply, although it is my intention soon to visit the Emerald City and arrange to give a course of lectures to select audiences on the advantages of magnification. We are bound for the Emerald City now, said the Tin Woodman, so if it pleases you to do so, you are welcome to travel in our company. The Wogglebug bowed with profound grace. It will give me great pleasure, said he, to accept your kind invitation, for nowhere in the land of Oz could I hope to meet so congenial a company. That is true, acknowledged the pumpkin head. We are quite as congenial as flies and honey. But pardon me if I seem inquisitive. Are you not all rather, uh, rather unusual? asked the Wogglebug, looking from one to another with an unconcealed interest. No more so than yourself, answered the Scarecrow. Everything in life is unusual until you get accustomed to it. What rare philosophy, exclaimed the Wogglebug admiringly. Yes, my brains are working well today, admitted the Scarecrow, an accent of pride in his voice. Then if you are sufficiently rested and refreshed, let us bend our steps towards the Emerald City, suggested the magnified one. We can't, said Tip. The saw horse has broken a leg so he can't bend his steps, and there is no wood around to make him a new limb from, and we can't just leave the horse behind because the pumpkin head is so stiff in his joints that he has to ride. How very unfortunate, cried the Wogglebug. Then he looked the party over carefully and said, If the pumpkin head is to ride, why not use one of his legs to make a leg for the horse that carries him? I judge that both are made of wood. Now that is what I call real cleverness, said the Scarecrow approvingly. I wonder my brains did not think of that long ago. Get to work, my dear, and fit the pumpkin head's leg to the saw horse. Jack was not especially pleased with this idea, but he submitted to having his left leg amputated by the tin woodman and whittled down to fit the left leg of the saw horse. Nor was the saw horse especially pleased with the operation either, for he growled a good deal about being butchered, as he called it, and afterward declared that his new leg was a disgrace to a respectable saw horse. "'I beg you to be more careful in your speech,' said the pumpkin head sharply. "'Remember, if you please, that it is my leg you're abusing.' "'I cannot forget it,' retorted the sawhorse, "'for it is quite as flimsy as the rest of your person.' "'Flimsy! Me flimsy!' cried Jack in a rage. "'How dare you call me flimsy!' "'Because you are built as absurdly as a jumping jack,' sneered the horse, rolling his knotty eyes in a vicious manner. "'Even your head won't stay straight, and you can never tell whether you're looking backwards and forwards.' "'Friends, I entreat you not to quarrel,' pleaded the tin woodman anxiously. "'As a matter of fact, we are none of us above criticism, so let us bear with each other's faults.' "'An excellent suggestion,' said the Wogglebug approvingly. "'You must have an excellent heart, my metallic friend.' "'I have,' returned Nick, well pleased. "'My heart is quite the best part of me. "'But now let us start upon our journey.' "'They perched the one-legged pumpkin head upon the sawhorse "'and tied him to his seat with cords, "'so that he could not possibly fall off. "'And then, following the lead of the scarecrow, "'they all advanced in the direction of the Emerald City.' "'Old Mombi Indulges in Witchcraft' They soon discovered that the sawhorse limped, for his new leg was a trifle too long, so they were obliged to halt while the tin woodman chipped it down with his axe, after which the wooden steed paced along more comfortably. But the sawhorse was not entirely satisfied even yet. It was a shame that I broke my other leg, it growled. On the contrary, airily remarked the wogglebug who was walking alongside, you should consider the accident most fortunate, for a horse is never of much use until he has been broken. "'Beg your pardon,' said Tip, rather provoked, for he, for he felt a warm interest in both the sawhorse and the man Jack. "'But permit me to say that your joke is a poor one, and as old as it is poor.' "'Still, it is a joke,' declared the Wogglebug firmly, "'and a joke derived from a play upon words is considered among educated people to be eminently proper.' "'What does that mean?' inquired the pumpkin head stupidly. "'It means, my dear friend,' explained to the Wogglebug, that our language contains many words having a double meaning, and that to pronounce a joke that allows both meanings of a certain word proves the joker a person of culture and refinement, who has, moreover, a thorough command of the language. I don't believe that, said Tip plainly. Anyone can make a pun. 
Not so, rejoined the Wogglebug stiffly. It requires an education of a high order. Are you educated, young sir? Not especially, admitted Tip. Then you cannot judge the matter. I myself am thoroughly educated, and I say that puns display genius. For instance, were I to ride upon this sore horse, he would not only be an animal, he would become an equipage, for he would then be a horse and buggy. At this, the scarecrow gave a gasp, and the tin woodman stopped short and looked reproachfully at the wogglebug. At the same time, the sore horse loudly snorted his derision, and even the pumpkin head put up his hand to hide the smile which, because it was carved upon his face, he could not change to a frown. But the wogglebug strutted along as if he had made some brilliant remark, and the scarecrow was obliged to say, "'I have heard, my dear friend, that a person can become over-educated, and although I have a high respect for brains, no matter how they may be arranged or classified, I begin to suspect that yours are slightly tangled. In any event, I must beg you to restrain your superior education while in our society.' "'We are not very particular.' added the Tin Woodman, and we are exceedingly kind-hearted, but if your superior culture gets leaky again... He did not complete the sentence, but he twirled his gleaming axe so carelessly that the Wogglebug looked frightened and shrank away to a safe distance. The others marched on in silence, and the highly magnified one, after a period of deep thought, said in a humble voice, I will endeavour to restrain myself. That is all we can expect, returned the Scarecrow pleasantly, and good nature being thus happily restored to the party, they proceeded upon their way. When they again stopped to allow Tip to rest, the boy being the only one that seemed to tire, the tin woodman noticed many small round holes in the grassy meadow. "'This must be a village of field mice,' he said to the scarecrow. "'I wonder if my old friend the Queen of the Mice is in this neighbourhood. "'If she is, she may be of great service to us,' answered the scarecrow, who was impressed by a sudden thought. See if you can call her, my dear Nick. So the tin woodman blew a shrill note upon a silver whistle that hung around his neck, and presently a tiny grey mouse popped up from a nearby hole and advanced fearlessly towards them, for the tin woodman had once saved her life, and the queen of the field mice knew he was to be trusted. Good day, your majesty, said Nick, politely addressing the mouse. I trust you are enjoying good health. Thank you, I am quite well, answered the queen demurely as she sat up and displayed the tiny golden crown upon her head. "'Can I do anything to assist my old friends?' "'You can indeed,' replied the Scarecrow eagerly. "'Let me, I entreat you, take a dozen of your subjects with me to the Emerald City.' "'Will they be injured in any way?' asked the Queen doubtfully. "'I think not,' replied the Scarecrow. "'I will carry them hidden in the straw which stuffs my body, and when I give them the signal by unbuttoning my jacket, they have only to rush out and scamper home again as fast as they can. By doing this, they will assist me to regain my throne, which the army of revolt has taken from me. In that case, said the Queen, I will not refuse your request. Whenever you are ready, I will call twelve of my most intelligent subjects. I am ready now, returned the Scarecrow. Then he lay flat upon the ground and unbuttoned his jacket, displaying the mass of straw with which he was stuffed. The queen uttered a little piping call, and in an instant a dozen pretty field mice had emerged from their holes and stood before their ruler, awaiting her orders. What the queen said to them none of our travellers could understand, for it was in the mouse language, but the field mice obeyed her without hesitation, running one after another into the scarecrow and hiding themselves in the straw of his breast. When all of the twelve mice had thus concealed themselves, the scarecrow buttoned his jacket securely, and then arose and thanked the queen for her kindness. One more thing you might do to serve us, suggested the Tin Woodman, and that is to run ahead and show us the way to the Emerald City, for some enemy is evidently trying to prevent us from reaching it. I will do that gladly, returned the Queen. Are you ready? The Tin Woodman looked at Tip. I'm rested, said the boy. Let us start. When they resumed their journey, the little grey queen of the field mice running swiftly ahead, and then pausing until the travellers drew near, when away she would dart again, Without this unerring guide, the Scarecrow and his comrades might never have gained the Emerald City, for many were the obstacles thrown in their way by the arts of Old Mombi, yet not one of the obstacles really existed. All were cleverly contrived deceptions, for when they came to the banks of a rushing river that threatened to bar their way, the little queen kept steadily on, passing through the seeming flood in safety, and our travellers followed her without encountering a single drop of water.
Again, a high wall of granite towered high above their heads and opposed their advance, but the grey field mouse walked straight through it, and the others did the same, the wall melting into mist as they passed it. Afterward, when they had stopped for a moment to allow Tip to rest, they saw forty roads branching off from their feet in forty different directions, and soon these forty roads began whirling around like a mighty wheel, first in one direction, then in the other, completely bewildering their vision. But the Queen called for them to follow her, and darted off in a straight line, and when they had gone a few paces, the whirling pathways vanished and were seen no more. Mombi's last trick was the most fearful of all. She sent a sheet of crackling flame rushing over the meadow to consume them, and for the first time the scarecrow became afraid and turned to fly. "'If that fire reaches me, I will be gone in no time,' said he, trembling until his straw rattled. "'It's the most dangerous thing I ever encountered.' "'I'm off too,' said the sawhorse, turning and prancing with agitation, "'for my wood is so dry it would burn like kindlings.' "'Is fire dangerous to pumpkins?' asked Jack fearfully. "'You'll be baked like a tart, and so will I,' answered the Wogglebug, getting down on all fours so he could run the faster. But the Tin Woodman, having no fear of fire, averted the stampede by a few sensible words. "'Look at the field mouse!' he shouted. "'The fire does not burn her in the least. In fact, it is no fire at all, but a deception.' Indeed, to watch the little queen march calmly through the advancing flames restored courage to every member of the party, and they followed her without even being scorched. "'This is surely the most extraordinary adventure,' said the Wogglebug, who was greatly amazed, "'for it upsets all the natural laws that I heard Professor Know-it-all teach in the schoolhouse.' "'Of course it does,' said the Scarecrow wisely. "'All magic is unnatural, and for that reason is to be feared and avoided.' But I see before us the gates of the Emerald City, so I imagine we have now overcome all the magical obstacles that seem to oppose us. Indeed, the walls of the city were plainly visible, and the Queen of the Field Mice, who had guided them so faithfully, came near to bid them goodbye. We are very grateful to your Majesty for your kind assistance, said the Tin Woodman, bowing before the pretty creature. I am always pleased to be of service to my friends, answered the Queen, and in a flash, she had darted away upon her journey home. And welcome back. I hope you enjoyed part three of The Marvellous Land of Oz. If you did enjoy it, then please consider supporting The Well Told Tale on Patreon at patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale. There's a link in the description. I'll be back next week with part four, the penultimate part of the story. What adventures await our heroes as they return to the Emerald City? We'll find out next time. I hope you can join me. <laughs>